Okay students, um, I'm recording your lecture for week 12 and it's going to be a quick recording. Um, so chapter 23, public health, um, community health, and home health care. I'm not really going to lecture on really anything in here. Um, so that does not mean that you need to skip this part in your study. Okay, um, here are your learning out, um, outcomes for the chapter. Um, I am just, oh no. I am just going to run through this um, because the one thing I do want you to make sure that you concentrate on is levels of health care, um, primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Um, so make sure you know the difference in those. Um, and again, not that um, the rest of this chapter is not important. Um, but I don't feel I need to lecture on this. Um, so let me just make sure there's nothing else I wanted to point out. Well, obviously not, okay? So make sure you read that uh, this chapter. Um, all right, um, safety, and there's not gonna be a lot from this chapter, oops, um, that I'm going to cover as well. However, um, do not skip this in your study and in your reading, okay? I don't know what's wrong with my thing. So here's your learning um, outcomes for the chapter. Um, so, um, you know, Joint Commission um, does require us to um, uh, do some safety things for our patients. And they publish a report every year called the National Patient Safety Goals. And um, it's the things that they have identified um, as safety issues for patients, okay? So identifying um, patients correctly, so um, they have this statement, they have the definition of this, um, and they also have what is required of us to um, make sure that we um, identify patients correctly. Okay, so that's why you have all those patient identifiers. Um, improve staff communication, so we have a lot of mandatory education about staff um, as far as um, our where we work, where we're employed, um, that we have to um, do these like yearly um, education things on staff communication um, because that is one of the things that they have found that is a key factor in sentinel events. And if you remember, sentinel events are events where the patient is harmed. So they have identified that staff communication and a large portion of those um, was the problem. Um, uses medicine safely, so um, safe, admin, um, medis, uh, safe medication administration, so your six rights, or how, however many there are now, what, seven, eight, or nine, um, and then your three safety checks. Um, the use of alarms, uh, use alarms safely. So um, when you have some sort of monitor on your patient, um, that you set one, your alarm parameters and that they're appropriate, that you have the volume so that you can hear them um, because um, some of the Sentinel events are, one, the alarm parameters weren't set correctly. So for instance, um, it is, I don't wanna say it's common. So something that has happened is like when we have continuous oxygen saturation monitoring on our patient and our patient is alarming because their oxygen saturations drop anywhere between 86 and 87 percent. Well, a lot of times even a healthy individual, especially when they're sleeping, um, might drop a little bit. Their oxygen saturations might, might drop a little bit. Um, so this is an irritant to nurses to always have to be jumping up every time the SAT drops to 89%. Um, so they set the alarm parameter lower. So if it drops to 86, um, you know, maybe that's okay, but, but then the nurse would feel justified in getting up if it dropped below 86, like 84 or 82. Well, that's wrong, okay? Um, but it does happen, okay? So setting those alarm parameters correctly. And then also, you know, um, the, the nurse is um, close to the patient bedside or um, 
the alarm goes off and it wakes the patient or it wakes the visitors, you know, if they're all sleeping or whatever. So they turn down the alarms. And then what happens is, or what has happened is, the nurse maybe left the patient's room or the patient's bedside or wherever she was, where she was in close proximity, and maybe she got called away on, on something. Anyways, that alarm went off and no one could hear it. Um, so that's part of that. Um, preventing infection, so, you know, our hand hygiene, our strict aseptic techniques, our strict sterile techniques, um, identifying patient safety risks. Um, that has to do with, you know, identifying things in the patient environment that could put them at risk. For instance, um, you have um, some sort of, um, like an IV pump or the sequential TED machine or something. You have some sort of machine that has to be plugged in uh, with an electrical cord. And so we have these cords laying all about on the floor and that presents a uh, safety risk for the patient. So that's just an example. And prevent mistakes in surgery. This is another huge area of patient safety where they go in to do um, a left total knee, uh, a left below the knee amputation and they amputate the wrong leg. Okay, so that's just another example. And uh, mistakes in surgery are where, um, you know, when they do surgery, they have these things called lap sponges. Um, those are like little clothy things with a radio opaque blue tag on it, a clothy tag that they, um, well, they use it to help um, sop up blood and all that kind of stuff. Um, when they're doing a surgery. And sometimes those things get left in, in a patient and then the patient is um, sewed up and sent to recovery or an instrument will be left in a patient. So those are all bad, bad things. And um, so we have all these mechanisms in place, these checks and balances to make sure that we're not, or that we're not um, making these mistakes anymore. So. Um, anyways, the Joint Commission it publishes this every year, and um, I'm actually going to, if I haven't already, and I think maybe I haven't, but I'm going to post on the Moodle for week 12, I'm just going to post that National Patient Safety Goal um, paperwork so you can just look over it and just kind of see what it looks like, okay? Um, and then, of course, we have our um, safety, uh, QSIN, quality and safety education for nurses, so... Um, that's a big um, deal, okay? So um, this section, um, factors affecting safety. So um, you guys, these are pretty basic. You guys can, and, and pretty um, um, pretty easy to um, understand. So if you have any questions about stuff that I didn't go over, please let me know, okay? Um, anyway, so I'm just kind of running through here. Um, your assessment. Um, so when we do our assessment on our patients, um, we will do a quick safety assessment of them in the hospital, okay? Um, that's part of those safety checks, like are the side rails up? Is the bed lock? Is it in low position? Um, you know, check your equipment and all those kind of things. But um, this, this whole big crazy assessment, safety in the home, poisoning, um, uh, hazards, all those kind of things. We don't necessarily do that kind of thorough assessment um, on every patient we admit or every patient we discharge. However, if we are a community health nurse, a public health nurse, if we are a discharge planning nurse, or if, um, did I say home health nurse? Um, you know, if we're going into the home or if we're uh, providing them some sort of um, treatments at home or equipment for the home um, or if the reason that they're sick or seeking medical care is because of an issue here um, that harmed them then maybe we need to do a more thorough assessment of their home situation um, but this is not something that we'll typically do on every patient we admit in the hospital okay um, but I do want you to kind of be aware of these things um, um, I do want to point out these fall risk assessments. You will be doing a fall risk assessment probably on every single patient 
I don't know why I said probably, because yes, indeed, on every single patient that is admitted in the hospital. And sometimes these fall risk assessments are done just at admission. Some are done every shift. Um, so um, just depending on what the hospital chooses to use. Um, I'm used to the John Hopkins um, hospital fall assessment. And I think... The Hendrick is what they use at St. Pat's, but don't quote me, but the John Hopkins they use at Community. So these are what those assessments look like. So basically, you answer these questions on your patient, and because of your answers, your patient will get a score, depending on the answer. And then you add up the score, and if you see way at the bottom of this one, oh, I can point with my cursor, total points scored, if they're at moderate risk, well, if their points are 6 to 13, they're at moderate risk. If their points are above 13, they're at high risk. And let me see this next slide. So then, when you decide what risk factor your patient falls into, here are your interventions to protect your patient, okay? So that's John Hopkins. There's one called the Morris Fall Scale. I am looking over that i'm trying maybe maybe it's the morris fall scale that saint pat uses anyways i don't know but wherever you work you'll um be trained to use whatever um risk assessment um, they use at that facility uh <clears throat> here are your nursing diagnoses um we will not be um so please i'm not telling you not to look at these and not to understand these as far as safety for your patient okay because you might be working in an area where you're a safety nurse or something i don't know so you want to know what your options are as far as safety okay um but but in our skills lab we will not be writing diagnoses um specific to these okay and then here are your um patient goals just just some ideas of patient goals okay or examples all right um so here again is explaining um, some of these um, safety things that have happened to patients that have resulted in um, litigation or a lawsuit, okay? Um, so falls, um, fa falls ha I want to say falls happen a lot in the hospital, especially with the elderly or people with some sort of um, sensory deficit or something like that, okay? Not every fall means that the, the nurses or the staff were negligent, okay, in any way, shape, or form. However, every fall that happens in the hospital has to be documented, and that documentation goes to uh, the risk manager for your facility, and they investigate those falls to find out was it negligence or was it a process, uh, was it part of a process that we could improve or um, 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 some things like that, okay? So um, please do not be afraid of falls. Please do not be afraid to report falls and to document falls. And definitely, definitely, like your patient needs to be assessed. And um, that assessment, that quick assessment that you as a nurse do um, with your patient who falls, then you're going to be the one pretty much to decide, well, n no, you're not going to decide, I'm sorry. Um, you're going to be the one to recommend to the physician because you will need to call the physician and report the event um, and, or, and report your assessment and then recommend, like SBAR, uh, what you think um, you should do for the patient. So, and then of course they, they the physician will give you orders, even, um, even maybe some orders that you did not recommend. So that's great. But anyways, here are some very important things, um, for you to do as a nurse, um, to protect your patient from falls. So keeping the call light within the patient's reach. That's why it's so imperative that in, in found in, in, um, uh, in nursing lab that you practice every time you go to a mannequin and you practice a skill that part of the skill you're practicing is that when you leave the patient room that you automatically every time you check to make sure that the call light is, is within their reach okay um, and putting their items close to the patient doing hourly rounds um, so most 
um, facilities have uh, implemented hourly rounds where people, not just the RN, um, sometimes your, um, you know, your team, whether that be a CNA or, or whoever, um, someone's doing an hourly round on the patient, just going in, checking the equipment, checking the safety, checking um, that the water is full, checking that the IV bags don't need replaced, checking if the patient needs. So hourly roundings, they're also called four Ps. Um, so pain, pump, potty, and positioning. So basically what that means is you address the patient's pain, you check their pumps and or equipment, um, um, pain pump, potty, so you offer to take the patient to the bathroom um, or toilet them or bedpan or whatever they're using, um, and then you check the patient's position and make sure that they're comfortable and propped and the blankets are straight and nice and all that good gar garbage, okay? Um, and then for your patients who are, who are at high risk for falling, um, a common practice is to make sure that that patient's room is close to the nurse's station so that, you know, um, someone can be almost eyeballing that patient all the time, okay? Um, so here again, you know, making sure that the brakes are set, like when, when you're in a room doing something with a patient and you leave, checking those side rails are up checking that the bed is in low position and checking the brakes on the bed, okay? Um, and then of course the wheelchair as well. Um, so if you've never been in a patient room, so these are patient bathrooms and you can see here that we, of course we have the grab bars everywhere, but we have this string, that's the patient call light if they're in the bathroom. So they pulled that and then um, usually there's not like um, it's not connected to the intercom where they can say what do you need um, but the alarm that sounds in the unit is very different than the alarm that sounds if the patient is just hitting their call light on their bed and everybody is attuned to the sound of that bathroom alarm and usually when that bathroom alarm goes off then a staff all staff that hear that alarm run to that patient's room because many times when a patient pulls that you know, they feel like they're going to pass out or maybe they've fallen or something, so we run, okay? And then here's showers. If your patient's room has a shower, there's grab bars. A lot of time, um, patient showers are built with a stool that can fold up against the wall or it can be unfolded and the patient can sit on it for their shower. And then right here by the shower is another of the, that pull string to um, call for help, okay? Um, restraints are a big area of safety and litigation. So, um, if you remember, did we talk about, um, false imprisonment, um, being, um, um, uh, a, a area of litigation for healthcare workers. If you, uh, restrain a patient, you can, um, uh, you can be brought up on charges for false imprisonment. Um, but there are times we need to restrain patients. So, um, a lot of times, so not only um, false imprisonment, but um, there have been deaths that have occurred um, because patients were restrained. They were restrained improperly. Um, they weren't checked as often as they needed to be checked, um, this, that, and the other. Not only um, um, have patients died when they um, have been restrained, um, but sometimes the, the restraints that we, that we apply to the patient um, cut off circulation, we apply them too tight, we damage whatever, whatever, um, or the patient tries to escape from the restraint and ends up strangling themselves or something like that. So restraints are very serious things. And because of that, Joint Commission um, has um, mandated um, protocols for us to follow when we need to apply restraints. Okay. And one of those is that we use the least um, restrictive um, form of restraint as possible, and then we in, we re, <coughs> excuse me we increase the res, the restrictions or the um, re, we increase that as as our um, interventions fail. Okay, so we go least restrictive to most restrictive, um, and then there has to be specific orders written. Um, there has to be specific assessments on the patients, specific time frames in which these assessments have to occur, and this, that, and the other, and all kinds of things. 
Um, so when you start your job at a facility um, and part of your orientation and your training to this new uh, facility and new unit is this massive restraint protocol and safety that you have to get signed off, signed off, signed off on, okay? Um, so anyways, um, so patient beds, so two rails up. Two rails up are not considered a restraint. Two rails up are for patient positioning and prevention of falls, or just to remind the patient, hey, um, you might need to call for help when you get up, okay? But if we put up all four side rails, that is considered a form of restraint. So don't do that unless it's specifically ordered, okay? And it is a safety thing. So it's easy for a patient to get out of bed when just the two rails are up. But if you have a confused patient that's ambulatory, for some, um, and so they're confused, and you have four rails up and hopes to keep them in the bed, that won't keep them in the bed. They're just gonna climb over those rails and they're gonna fall and hurt themselves, okay? So a um, lot of um, things about restraints. Um, so um, here is some um, things that we will try, less restrictive things that we will try um, as an alternative to applying physical restraints. Um, so you can look over those. Um, there was something else. Oh, so um, when you set a patient in a wheelchair, some wheelchairs, especially in long-term care facilities, some wheelchairs have um, a tray that you can like slide onto the wheelchair and lock into place, kind of like a high chair. That is considered a restraint. So we gotta be careful about those things. Anyways. Um, so this is just being more specific about some of the safety areas um, and then um, evaluation, of course. Evaluation. Every time you provide an intervention um, or, or do an assessment um, and then provide an intervention, you always have to evaluate and then um, maybe change your intervention. Okay. Um, all right. So the last chapter is... Um, Activity, um, oops, and immobility. Oh, so in foundation in lab this week, we are going to practice applying um, restraints and the different kinds of restraint, r restraints that we have, okay? Um, all right. So activity, immobility, and safe movement. So here are your <coughs> learning objectives. Um, I am not going to um, go over normal structure, but please do review these things. Um, um, okay, um, I, I do actually want to point out, like, this does explain things very well, but when we talk about mobility and immobility, it's just not the muscular skeletal system that we're um, referring to. We're referring also to their neurological capabilities and their cardiopulmonary capabilities as well, okay? So those all affect a patient's mobility. Um, so that breaks down the muscular skeletal um, contributions. Here are your nervous system contributions when it comes to normal structure, your cardiopulmonary contributions when it comes to normal structure, okay? Um, so altered structure, of course, you're gonna have some problem with one of these systems. Imagine that, okay? So impaired mobility um, can be um, from the musculoskeletal system, uh, a problem with their muscles, their skeleton, broken bones, um, um, arthritis, um, um, whatever, okay? Um, their diet has a lot to do with um, their, the health of their bones. So um, um, their exercise also has to do with their bone health and their muscle health, okay? So look over those. Um, so um, as far as neurological um, alterations, so the brain and spinal cord um, can affect a person's mobility. So if they have um, ischemia, uh, which is reduced blood flow to the brain, or if they, um, which will cause, you know, hemoparesis, which is weakness on one side, or hemoplegia, which is paralysis on one side, um, those come in the form of cerebral vascular accidents, strokes, or even traumatic brain injuries, okay? So those will all affect a patient's ability um, to move. And then, and then there's the spinal cord injuries. So 
Um, depending on the level of the spinal cord injury, the person could be a paraplegic, which means just their lower body is paralyzed, um, or they could be a quadriplegic, so um, both their upper and lower body are paralyzed. Um, when we talk about um, um, alterations in cardiac function, so car uh, so the you know the heart that pumps um, the blood to our body so if our heart is not pumping well enough to supply um, the oxygen our body needs in order to fuel our muscles and our movements then we're going to have a problem okay um and then oh and then um respiratory as well so if a person is not able to if they have a respiratory problem um where they're not breathing, they can't get enough oxygen, that's going to affect their um, level of mobility, okay? Um, <clears throat> so this is an example of um, some poor old gal, probably, um, who has contractures. You can have contractures of the hands, wrists, elbows, um, contractures of the waist, contractures of the knees, the ankles, um, the hips. Um, anywhere there's a joint, you can have a contracture, and this is permanent. So basically what happened with this gal is um, she was put in a bed, and she was left to lay there. They did no movement exercises or anything on this gal's hands. So as she's just laying there, the body starts contracting. It's almost like drying up. Um, you know, when you've got um, some mud and um, the mud dries up, it, it, it looks like it shrinks and contracts. Um, that's what happens to our joints, okay, and our ligaments and, um, and all those kind of things. And this is permanent. Like this, we won't, you won't be able, if you go in there and try to straighten her wrist and hands and fingers out, you'll probably um, snap, some, break something, okay? So there is ways to prevent this. And one of those ways is not putting a patient in a bed and walking out of the room and never going back in there again. Okay, uh, I mean this is this is this is prolonged neglect here. Okay, this doesn't happen overnight, but you know this is prolonged neglect. All right, foot drop is another. It's a similar. Um, it's a contracture um, of the plantar um, uh, plantar flexion. So you know. This looks like she's almost, you know, kind of making that arch occur right here. Um, you know, you can do that. You can make your foot do that. Like, you can just do that. Um, and, like, she's, like, really extending this joint here. Um, well, this is a contracture. This is permanent. This won't, sh this person's foot is always like this. And imagine trying to stand this person up. This, you can't stand them up. They're, um, so this foot is always in this position, okay? It won't ever stop. I'm being, um, honing that point too much. Okay, so um, as far as our um, muscular skeletal system, you know, we have, um, you know, uh, osteoporosis or pathological bone fractures, which are basically spontaneous fractures um, uh, where we don't have to, like, have fallen or, you know, and broken a hip or something like that. Um, these are, um, these are alterations in our bone structure, um, our bone mass, our bone density, and puts us at risk for, um, um, those problems. Um, I'm not actually sure why this, um, well, I'll try to make it work. So, uh, another, this probably should have been up with the neurological alterations. Um, but if your patient does have some sort of neurological alteration where um, they get dizzy um, upon standing because of some sort of um, equilibrium problem um, with a, or motion problem, or if it's related to um, blood pressure, okay, hypotension. So we do what's called dangling. And so what that means is you sit the patient, so they're in the bed, um, and you sit the patient up on the side of the bed and their legs are dangling off the side of the bed, okay? That's just what that is. So that just gives the patient a little time to get oriented, um, you know, let their blood pressure stable, let their equilibrium um, stable, and, and then we're able to uh, stand the patient. Um, and then of course, um, you know, their gait, which is their manner, which is the way they walk, um, 
um, that will tell us a lot about any type of altered structural problems they have. Um, so a patient on bed rest um, is going to impact just about every one of their systems, not just their muscular skeletal and um, uh, their cardiopulmonary is one because when you're laying in bed, you don't breathe as deeply or as fully as you normally do. Um, your blood flow, your blood return to the heart is compromised, okay? Um, so, you know, you're just just laying there and, and your blood is not circulating well, you're not breathing well, uh, even though, I mean, you're, you may be short of breath a little bit, but um, you're just laying there relaxed, like you're not breathing as much. So that's going to present a problem when you do start to move, okay? Um, um, and another problem that will happen if you're if you if you have a mobility problem and you're on bed rest, um, even if you're not on continuous bed rest, um, but you could run the risk of having a deep vein, uh, a clot in your in your lower extremities. Okay, so with that circulatory um, compromise from just laying there in the bed, so you can set yourself up for pooling and clotting in the lower extremities. Okay. And then, of course, if that clot moves up into the lungs or the brain, then we still have uh, heart, lungs, or brain. We, we have a big problem, okay? Um, so I, I left this in here um, because when we do our assessments on um, to see if our patient has uh, clotting or, or possi possible starting to clot, um, typically in the past we did an assessment called a Homan, a Homan sign which is where you just slightly flex the knee and then you dorsiflex the foot. In other words, you you um, like pull the toes back towards the knee. That's called dorsiflexing the foot. And if the patient had a clot, then um, that would be a painful thing for us to do to them. But the problem with Homan sign is it doesn't always identify clots, okay? And um, you might do this Homan sign and elicit a pain response because the person is not flexible enough or whatever and you pull the muscle or maybe they have sore muscles to begin with um, and then the other thing is is if they did have a clot and you did this aggressively enough um, you could potentially dislodge the clot so we do not do home and sign and if you remember the other day in lab I told you when you're checking for a clot you are visualizing their calves looking for swelling, redness, you're palpating for warmth, and um, whether or not you can feel um, some, um, some swelling or uh, a knot in their cough, uh, calf. And then, um, and then, you know, if you do a little bit firmer palpation on their calf, if that hurts them um, in one pinpoint area, then um, you need to pass that on to the provider because they might definitely be having a clot. Okay. Um, the other thing with um, altered uh, mobility is that now the patient is at risk for ulcers. Okay, and we've talked about that um, previously. So um, we decrease their metabolic rate. Um, we decrease their appetite. We decrease their bowel function, their bowel motility. Um, it can cause constipation. Um, we decrease their um, urinary elimination, and um, they could have stasis or pooling. Well, of course, they're gonna have pooling of urine in the bladder, but um, um, they're, it's, it's gonna be sta stagnant. They're, it's gonna be what we call urinary stasis and set them up for an infection, okay? Um, and then the psychological impacts of a person who is has immobility problems, okay? so. Definitely your patient who's a quadriplegic or a paraplegic, um, you, you know that patient is going to have some serious um, emotional issues about that. So, um, and it's not just those um, plegia patients, it's any patient that has some sort of immobility issue for whether it's temporary or prolonged, whether it's weight, um, no matter why it's um, a problem. So maybe they had surgery and they're on uh, prolonged bed rest or maybe it's an OB patient that's at risk for preterm labor and she's on prolonged bed rest like th this is going to impact them um, emotionally 
and um, and socially like they're not going to be able to work they're not going to be able to visit with their friends are not going to be able to go and do this and that and and all kinds of things so we need to address those issues for that patient as well um, here are your health assessment questions um, so we definitely are wanting to assess the patient's uh, mobility um, with each assessment and definitely their um, admitting assessment that admis admitting history that you guys are practicing um, we do a fall risk assessment and then we implement according to their risk level we imp implement uh, a reduction interventions to prevent falls as much as we can and then um, we do document on this risk assessment every shift and then um, you know we reassess every shift as well um, and then depending on the risk factors of these patients or their risk level we may be doing um, their fall risk assessment more frequently. All right, so here are some nursing diagnoses that you can use um, for your patient. Please do look over these because you will be needing to um, identify these in lab class this week. Um, um, and so there's um, some full statements for you. Um, and here are some patient goals for you to um, review and possibly um, use something similar to these in lab this week. So, um, so when we talk about implementation, uh, first we're going to talk about exercise. So yes, exercise is very important um, to, some form of exercise is very important to, um, for the patient to be involved in um, to keep their um, muscular skeletal strength and their cardiovascular respiratory um, health, okay? So we're, there's all kinds of exercises from um, aerobic exercises to um, range of motion ex exercises. So we have kind of defined them. So isotonic, isometric, aerobic, and anaerobic. Please um, learn these definitions and um, so that you're able to identify which type of exercises are appropriate for these different categories. And I've provided you with examples of each, okay? Um, we always need to make sure that we're assessing pain, especially when it, when it comes to moving a patient or having a patient ambulate or um, any type of activity for a patient. So if a patient is having a lot of pain, of course, they might not want to move so much. So it's important that they move. So we might need to medicate them prior to any activity that we're going to do with the patient. Okay. So assess your pain, um, treat your pain, and then um, you can proceed with your activities. Now, a patient who is, who is on bed rest, uh, we do, it's very important that we um, know how to position these patients in bed for proper body alignment and positioning of joints so that we don't cause those contractures. Um, we don't cause um, pressure ulcers and things like that, okay? So we, we use pillows. Um, uh, we might need to use um, uh, different kinds of splints, and I'll show you some of those. Um, we might eat um, these hand rolls, like someone, if someone would have put a hand roll in that old gal's um, hand, she might not have had those contractures, um, but there's all kinds of things we can do, okay? So here is um, some different splinting um, things. So the top picture um, does show like a boot type thing to help prevent um, contractures of the ankle and the foot. Um, so to help prevent a foot drop um, or this uh, footboard that we see here. Um, so that helps keep the patient's foot flexed so they don't um, develop the foot drop. And then this hand roll is just a simple cloth, uh, a wash rag rolled up to keep this, um, this gal's um, wrist and fingers and um, knuckles in proper alignment. Now, the other thing too, though, is um, we, so if you keep these people in these splints and um, this hand roll and all kinds of things, like we can create, still create contractures. So uh, we'll start going over range of motion activities, okay? Um, so that's an important part 
of um, using splints and things like this, okay, is the range of motion activities. Um, okay, so, um, all right. Um, now, when we are ambulating a patient who has immobility problems, we might need some sort of assistive devices. So we will start, uh, we will look through um, some of the assistive devices, and we will also be using those in lab class this week. So I'll just kind of go over uh, a gait belt. So any, any patient that needs assistance moving, okay, I don't care. If she's just moving from a bed to a wheelchair or if you're walking her down the hall, if she needs assistance or he, uh, you must use a gait belt, okay? Um, if you have a patient with an immobility problem or a gait problem or a strength problem or um, a balance problem or whatever, and you're assisting them to ambulate and they do start to go down, there is... Uh, it, it's going to be very difficult for you to protect that patient as they fall, okay, um, without this gait belt. And this gait belt will also help steady um, this patient. So, anyways, we will review how to use that gait belt. Um, some patients, all they need um, is a cane for assistance. Um, and we will look at some different canes here. So, this first cane um, in picture A is called a quad cane. Um, and then the next two pictures are just regular canes. Um, they have some different shapes. Um, some are metal, some are wood, some are, um, um, you know, have and have these different kinds of shapes, okay? Um, crutches is another thing that we're going to be using for our patients with uh, mobility problems. And there are correct ways and several different ways to walk with crutches. Um, so we will review those in lab class, okay? Um, um, here's some different, um, different ways to walk with a crutch, but again, we will review those in, um, lab class. Okay, so here's some more. Um, so there's basically two different kinds of crutches, um, and these two different types, you know, they can look different, but, um, this first one is what you're probably used to seeing. They're the under the arm crutch, um, and then the second one is called a forearm crutch. And the forearm crutch can be like this, or it can actually be um, there. So this, um, in picture B, this guy's forearms are vertical. There are some crutches where their forearms are horizontal um, or perpendicular to um, the floor. But anyways, um, these are usually used for people who don't, who have a permanent gait problem or a permanent muscular skeletal problem or a permanent neurological problem or something okay um and then we'll learn how to um, go up and down sta uh, um, stairs with crutches in lab class okay um and here's just pictures of um the best way to do that so um when you're going up the stairs you put um well i'm i'm not going to explain this today well i will um, when you go up the stairs, you put the crutch on the affected leg side and you put your weight on the crutch and then you step up with your good foot and pull yourself up. Okay, so then he'll pull the crutch up to this step and then he'll put the weight on the crutch and then he'll step up with the good foot and pull himself up. Okay, and then you kind of do it the opposite way going down the steps. Okay, so um, and you, you always want to do this with a rail. Okay, so in this picture, um, the, the patient is putting the crutch and the bad leg um, down the step and then she will pull the good leg down to that step and then put the crutch and the bad leg down to the step and then pull the good leg down. So we'll practice that, okay? Um, walkers are the other things that you'll be using um, with your patients and there are specific ways to use the walkers so we will go over that in lab class, okay? Here's a picture of a walker. Very nice. Um, mechanical lifts. So these are for patient safety and they're for staff safety. So if we have patients with mobility problems and we need to move the, these patients from one place to another, um, we can't just lift. I mean, we, we're not, um, you know, we, we can't lift 500 pounds on our own. Okay, so we... And your patients aren't 500 pounds, but um, we use lifts, okay? Now, here is, um, 
I'm trying to remember what this, I don't know if this is called a Hoyer lift or Lazy Susan lift. Um, anyways, all these lifts, they have different names. There, there are different ways to lift patients. What patients are sitting, patients are laying. Um, so anyways, um, we're required to use lifts in the, in the um, hospital. And when you um, are oriented to your facility, um, you will get training on all these different kinds of lifts and how to use them. Yes, it does take longer to move a patient with a lift. However, um, um, if you're trying to manually lift a patient with you and another nurse, then yeah, you can do it quickly and then you can hurt yourself and you can drop the patient and hurt the patient and then everybody's in a bad, bad juju. Okay, so we got to use these lifts. All right. They're really kind of cool. Um, and then, um, of course, you know, whatever we do with our patients, you know, we're documenting everything about what we've done with them. So, um, now patients with mobility issues, um, some of them, especially if they're on, um, continuous bed rest or prolonged bed rest, um, we will, um, may have to get them a special bed, um, or special, I'm sorry, special mattress or a special bed. Okay. Um, so you can look over these um, different um, different options for special beds. Um, some of the beds come with this thing called the trapeze bar. Uh, this is where the person um, has some strength, maybe in their upper extremities, um, but for some reason their lower extremities are um, compromised. So they can use this trapeze bar to help move themselves around in the bed. And this is what it looks like. Okay, so um, um, slide bars, um, slide boards. Uh, transfer boards. So um, uh, we will practice with transfers, but these are uh, these are ways that uh, we transfer patients from one bed to another, um, and this reduces um, the trauma to the patient, um, and um, it makes it easier for the people who are doing it to move big, big people, even people way bigger than them. Okay. So um, there are also correct ways to do this and incorrect ways. Um, so we'll, we'll be reviewing that. Okay. Um, and documentation, of course, of course. Um, so if your patient has a cardiopulmonary problem, um, that's affecting their mobility, then there's things that we can do, um, interventions we can do to help improve their cardiopulmonary status. And one, one, one simple, simple, great one to do is a coughing and deep breathing exercises or the use of an incentive spirometer. Um, but, um, um, raising the head of the bed, um, turning the patient often and repositioning the patient, um, will help with their cardiopulmonary status. Okay. Um, to help prevent, um, uh, DVTs, of course, we're going to, um, be, um, uh, doing range of motion activities, um, on the patient's legs, um, to help keep the blood flowing. Um, sometimes the patient can do the range of motion activity themselves. That's called active range of motion. Um, or sometimes they're not able to do the range of motion um, exercise by themselves. So we have to, we have to move their um, joints and their legs. And that's called um, passive range of motion. Okay, when we do it. Oh, here. Uh -huh. Here we defined it. Okay, range of motion. Okay, uh, where we're... We're um, moving the joints and moving the patient's extremities um, to help prevent contractures and, and keep their joints flexible, um, improve their strength, and keep blood flowing, okay? All right, and then what? Documentation, documentation. Um, and then positioning. We're going to go over some positioning of the patients, um, proper positioning for proper body alignment, and proper positioning to prevent contractures. And um, oops, I'm sorry, guys. Um, oh crap. Um, I'm sorry. Oops. I will call that person back. All right. Um, and of course, documentation, documentation, documentation. Um, oh, I don't know. Um, I may have missed it. Um, but the other thing I wanted to point out about positioning is how often you need to do it. Well, that depends on the patient's mobility, but if they're in, if they're immobile and you're positioning them, um, then um, you're probably needing to do it every two hours, okay? Um, all right, and then documentation. 
um, dangling. So this is the proper procedure for dangling, um, and we can we can we can practice that. Okay, helping a patient dangle. Okay. Um, so elimina uh, elimination interventions. So we want to make sure because you know bed rest. You know they don't they, they don't want to eat. Their bowels are slowing down. They're not wanting to drink. Um, uh, a lot of them will refuse to drink because they're they're not able to get up and go to the bathroom. They don't want to use a bedpan and they don't want blah blah blah, blah all these things. Okay, but we need to promote their um, nutrition, um, eating um, you know a good nutrition um, with fiber and all that kind of stuff and then drinking lots of fluids okay and then we need to um, help this these patients with toileting whether it be um, their bedpan the bedside commode getting these patients to the bathroom um, uh, we need to do these things for the patients and then um, you know a lot of patients you know it's um, a routine order for these patients who are on bed rest to have um, stool softeners given to them routinely um, so they don't get constipated and then also um, an as-needed order for um, some sort of stimulant laxative um, well um, uh, enema or um, a suppository of some sort to um, help them go okay um, just wanted to throw this in there um, I see a lot of people um, putting patients on bedpans when they're laying flat in the bed um, ouch and um, no thank you so set the patient up um, and um, uh, for the for them to use the bedpan and then any patient who is immobile oh here it is turn immobile patients every at least every three hours okay um, so we do want to make sure that we're assessing their skin um, for immobile patients okay um, and then turning them here are some different positioning options now um, you know the lithotomy position there like that's not going to be a positioning option um, for position changes and stuff like that but um, you know for our OB patients who are giving birth um, we might put them in that position and then um, the, like the Trendelenburg position the one on the bottom um, that one you typically use for patients who are having a, um, a severe hypotensive crisis um, so that is helpful, okay, or bleeding crisis, okay. Um, heel protectors are something that we might want to use um, if a patient has really bad um, skin problems, um, very poor nutrition, very poor, poor skin integrity, um, they're on continuous prolonged bed rest, we might need to use some additional protectors, um, heel and um, elbow protect and or elbow protectors and this is kind of what they look like they're just like a big cushioning thing that we put we could put on the heel or we could put on the elbow the elbow one looks similar to this okay um, and then your psychosocial interventions so do as much as you can to provide stimulation social stimulation for this patient do as much as you can to be emotionally supportive um, if you can get the patient um, you know, out for uh, walks or wheelchair rides or things like that, okay? Um, um, maybe um, for a patient who's on bed rest, um, maybe we could be um, um, having some sort of volunteer come visit with a patient if they don't have family or, you know, just all kinds of things that we can do. Um, and then, of course, evaluation and um, um, you know, making sure our interventions are appropriate and that our goals are being met. And then if they're, if they are great, if they're not, that we need to change things up. Okay, guys. Um, so that was pretty quick. Um, if you have any questions, you know, be sure to ask me. Otherwise, um, I will see you. Um, oh, wow. That was less than an hour. I'm sure. Huh. Okay. So uh, have, uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, wait. Yes tomorrow. Okay.